Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 641. Body Mass Index is Finally Being Questioned. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. I'm Dr. Kathy Maupin, and today we're going to talk about something that has been in the news recently. It has been a controversial subject because in medicine and in many other areas of government, we have used something called the BMI, or Body Mass Index, to determine whether um, an individual is underweight, overweight, or if they are obese, or, or even more obese, or severely obese. So it is one of those calculations that is very easy for us to make. We have a, a little graph, an X and Y axis, and we can look up somebody's height and somebody's weight and determine what their BMI is. So it's easy to calculate, which is why I think they used it. However, Body mass in index does not take into account genetic differences in muscle mass because muscle weighs a lot. So you can have a lot of muscle, which would increase your weight, but you could look like Adonis. You could look like a, a weightlifter, no body fat, and therefore not at risk for diseases, not at risk for um, being obese, for types of um, jobs that require that you be slender or that you be in good shape. This is one of those things that medicine has used, even though I never really thought it was a good measurement of people because there are certain folks that do have no muscle mass. They are all fat. <laughs> And when we put them on a uh, body composition machine that we have in three offices, the, um, the in-body machine, we can tell how much fat is in their body and how much muscle is in their body, how much bone is in their body, how much of their actual weight is determined by fat and how much is determined by, uh, by actual um, muscle and bone. So what if you have very thick bones? you are going to weigh more than somebody who has very thin bones or even osteoporosis. They're going to be more at risk for disease than you are if you have thick bones, but you're going to be calculated at a high BMI. Now, the range for BMI for height and weight calculations uh, is, this, is that you should be between 18.5 and 25. And that's these numbers made up on a, on a scale that tell you that you should be between 18.5 and 25 to be normal weight. If you're under 18.5, you're underweight. If you're over 25, you're overweight. If you're over 30, then you're obese. If you're over 35, then you're morbidly obese. So this is how they've made a very simple, it, it looks simple to calculate this. It's really not simple because individual differences make a huge difference in this uh, in this type of measurement. Doctors look at somebody and they, they don't know how much of, that bo of their body is fat and muscle. All they do is weigh them and, and measure their height and say, your BMI is this, you're overweight, you need to lose 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds, whatever it is. But what if that person is actually very mus muscular and has very good bones and they don't, generally those folks don't even look overweight when their BMI is high, they look very healthy, and they are very healthy. They are not at risk for the same diseases that someone who has a lot of fat and not muscle, who weighs the same as that person. So you could have, say we have two men who are um, five foot seven because they say the average man 
in America is still five foot seven and 170 pounds. But when I look around, that's not average. Most men weigh more and are taller than that. So, um, but they still go by the old standard when we were shorter and we weighed less decades ago, but they haven't changed that either. So that's the, that's the average. So let's say I have a man who's five foot seven and he is um, a, a bodybuilder and he weighs 200. If he weighs 200 instead of 170 pounds, then he's going to be considered obese. So what happens to this guy? He's been in shape, he's been exercising, he is not at risk for hypertension, he is not at risk for heart disease, his cholesterol is normal, but he weighs too much. So when he goes for life insurance, he is going to be told, you're at high risk, you need to lose weight. Well, honestly, he does. he's going to have my ideal fat uh, percentage, he may have a fat percentage of less than 19%, which is very good for a male and very healthy. He may be healthy in every way, but he can't get life insurance because his BMI is too high. That's why this is really unfair. It is also unfair for somebody who is five foot seven and may weigh 180, 10 pounds overweight, but has no muscle mass, is fat, has a huge waistline. That, that guy is at high risk for heart disease and is at high risk for high blood pressure, but will not be considered obese not, or even overweight. So that's why this system doesn't work. And all of a sudden, after all the years, I've, I don't remember a time in my 38-year uh, history of practicing medicine as a private practice that I didn't use BMI for something. So let's say in medicine we use BMI uh, often to determine if we are going to allow someone to have uh, a medication for uh, weight loss. So say we have somebody who wants to weigh less, but they have a big muscle mass, they have heavy bones, and they have very little fat on them, but they qualify for a weight loss drug. But someone who <laughs> has a lot of fat and no muscle and weighs um, a little bit over 25, maybe is 26 or 27, does not qualify for a weight loss drug. Because you have to be 30, a BMI of 30, to qualify for your insurance to pay for a weight loss drug. This just isn't fair. And it is something that we should have, we should have gotten over and fixed long time ago. And it is, it is something that I've, it's been a bee in my bonnet for a long time. That's why in our practice, we use a body composition machine. And the only numbers I look at, I don't really care about BMI, I care about percent body fat. So for females, percent body fat means percentage of your entire weight that is fat. So it gives us a little more equality for those of us who have a lot of muscle and may weigh more because we have a lot of muscle. So. So percent body fat, if a woman has a percent body fat of 26%, so a little over a quarter of their, her entire weight is fat, and you know fat's in your brain, fat's in your breasts, fat's in your, in your booty. So basically there are certain areas that women have more fat in than men. So if we are, if we are at the 26% or less, that is considered healthy. So I don't look at the BMI because that is it's false based on how much muscle there is or isn't. Now I want my, my patients, my female patients, to have a percent body fat that's greater than 18%. Because if they have less than 18% body fat, then they are probably too thin. If they get sick, they're not going to have enough fat as reserve if they can't eat while they're sick. They're going to be, it's going to be hard for them to recover. So, and as the older, the older you get, the more, more important it is that you have some body fat to kind of back you up if you have an illness that causes you not to be able to eat and to, and to lose fat. So between 18.5% and 26% is where I want women. Men, I want to have, it's a lower number that I always have problems with for, for guys, but guys should be under 
19%, believe it or not. They don't have breasts. They don't have big booties. They don't have places to put a lot of fat. So they should be in a, a different category being male and being you get most of your muscle and bone mass when you're kids and you're and as you're in your adolescence and you're growing and you're eating and and you're doing a lot of exercise that helps you build bone and muscle. So men, boys need to have less body fat than women to be healthy. So we look at 19% as as where we want our males no matter what age they are to be under 19% or 19%. Uh and they can go less than obviously 18%. So they can go down to about 10% and be quite healthy. So that's what we're looking at. And we believe that that is what should determine whether someone is really overweight or not. It really needs a weight loss drug or really is at risk for heart disease, really is at risk for diabetes, really is at risk for any kind of, of disease of aging that we treat all the time in our office. So that is our goal also for our weight loss program. We want our women to get below 26%. We want our men to get below 19%. That's our goal. We don't care what their weight is. We care what their body fat is. The more muscle you have, the healthier you are. You've all, always heard that from me because your muscle helps your brain work. Your muscle is, is where you burn all your calories. Your muscle is what keeps you actually standing up straight as you get older instead of leaning over and uh, losing muscle mass and bone mass at the same time. So it is very important to keep your muscle mass. And this e basically is the um, leveler so that we don't have to call people who aren't fat, fat or overweight. And we don't have to call and, and deal with them that way. And we don't have to call people who are actually need to lose fat that, and tell them they're fine because they may not be. So this is, this is one of those fallacies that finally has come to the fore because there are certain, um, there are certain differences in genetic populations. So in general, the darker your skin, the more muscle you have, the, the um, more bone mass you have, the heavier your bones. So... What's happened is, in many ways, we've made people who are African-American, Italian, Greek, Southern European, we've put them in classification of being not well, even if they are well, because they have more muscle and more bone. That isn't across the board, but that is generally the case. So let's use this example, which I find to be uh, compelling and very upsetting that if you are in the military for you to be for you to actually be uh, upgraded or promoted to a different level or a higher level which means higher level of pay higher level of of your uh, responsibilities you have to have a BMI of 25 or less now what if you are one of those guys that has lots of muscle and lots of bone. That is ridiculous because you're not going to be able to lose enough fat for you to actually be healthy and keep your muscle so that you can be promoted. So it places people of darker skin types in a bad position. It is discriminatory. It is something that is terrible and should never have happened, but it has kept people in a place they shouldn't have been kept in. And so this is something that I find to be abhorrent. We should never have let this happen all these years. I just, it just amazes me that nobody has brought this to the fore. But in that case, we are taking people who genetically can't help it. <laughs> and genetically, they're stronger than, than people who don't have as much muscle and have more fat. But those folks appear to be healthier. They're not. The more muscle you have, the more bone you have, the healthier you are. So that is what I, I, that's a message I want you to remember. I want you to remember that it is your percent body fat. It is not your weight versus height. It is just the percent body fat that you have versus the rest of your body, which is muscle and bone and skin and intestines, which don't weigh all that much, but, and water. So 
we figure water into this calculation too when we look at uh, body composition. So I don't like my weight loss patients looking at just their weight because when when you have good testosterone and you're young and healthy, you make a lot more muscle. So we give people testosterone, it makes them make more muscle. So they may be heavier, but they may they usually lose a lot of their body fat. So weight is not the key, size is, measurements are, and, and percent body fat is. So the, in the industries that depend on BMI to tell us what we can and cannot do, or can and cannot have, or how much we're paid, they are finally coming around to figure out that this is something they should correct. And they should correct it. It should have been corrected long ago. Um, I find that the AMA is finally behind this. I hope that that actually helps get this uh, passed in terms of all of these different agencies that use BMI as a measurement of, of obesity. And I have one other thing that they need to do next. What they need to do next is they need to... They, the government has decided, and, and the AMA has gone along with it, that every drug should be dosed based on an average male. Now, the average male that they have is 5'7 and 170 pounds. There aren't that many males at 5'7 and 170 pounds. That was a long time ago. We didn't weigh as much. We didn't have as good nutrition. We had not had the benefit of immunizations and, and the benefit of good health throughout our childhood. And therefore, we now have a population of people who are much bigger, much healthier, much taller, much more muscled. And we need to recognize that in terms of what our drug doses are. So I was, I, before we taped, I was sitting here thinking about um, the, the dose of drugs that I take for, say, an, an antibiotic for a, a lung infection would be, say, it's Keflex or, or Duras, Duracef twice a day. So it would be 500 milligrams twice a day. I weigh 125. My uh, body fat is 23%. My BMI is 22 or something. My husband gets the same dose. He weighs 250. He has a ton of muscle. He has... And he is not fat, he's muscled, and he's 6'4". So that makes no sense. Why should he get the same dose as me? And it's true, what I see in this is after years of not understanding or not thinking it through, he has to get two doses. He has to get a longer prescription because that, the doses aren't enough for his dilution in his blood volume. So here's the example. I'm 125, he's 250. My blood volume is 3.5 liters. So think of those IV bags. I have three and a half of those in terms of my blood volume. My husband has eight and a half of those liters. Eight and a half IV bags full of blood in his body. That means he should be getting twice as much of the medication that I, dose that I need at my blood volume, because the minute it gets into your system and it goes through your blood, it's diluted by the amount of blood you have. <laughs> and this is why when we treat children, we treat children based on their weight. And that usually, because in general, children will, will, based on their weight, their blood volume will go along with their weight. So that makes sense. Why we don't do that for adults, I don't know. So... This is the next horizon for the government and the AMA to take a look at because it makes no sense to judge all of us by an um, outdated average male and it's, it doesn't do any good to, <laughs> it, it is not helpful to use men always as their, as their uh, epitome of who the average American is. They should have one, one um uh, normal for females, one normal for males, and then base dosages on weight. That is the only thing that makes sense to me. We do that with pellets. We do that between genders. 
Women don't need as much testosterone. We never had as much testosterone. Our receptor sites are different than men's. We don't use it the same way as they do. So we need a different dosage of pellets. And it, at the same weight, say we were the same weight, if I had a 150-pound male and 150-pound female, the men would still be getting 10 times as much. Now, if that, if that man is 6'6", and weighs 270, then I increase the dose by a lot. If that female is 300 pounds, and, and not, no matter what her height is, she needs more. She, she needs more testosterone than somebody who's my size. Now, that isn't a hard and fast rule. Some people who are my size are like hummingbirds. They burn, their cal they burn calories all the time, they run, they're always moving and they burn calories while they sleep. They're, they're burning up their testosterone while they're even sleeping. So it's not a hard and fast rule for that because pellets are a little different. They're not oral tablets, they're not capsules. They, go, they are uh, managed based on your blood flow that flows by the pellets and picks up the blood, picks up the medicine in the blood. So it is, by vo it is distributed by blood volume, but it is not uh, taken from the pellet based on your uh, total blood volume. It's based basically on how active you are and how much your muscles are burning at all times. So that's the only exception. Otherwise, we should be dosing like we do with pellets, giving patients more medication for a larger blood volume. And that's the next thing that will come up in the news. You can just keep your eyes open for that. I'm glad you joined me today. I hope this gives you some information about how to look at uh, BMI, how in some cases you've been maybe denied insurance because of your BMI or been told you're high risk because of your BMI, yet it's not about b that it, you don't have a high BMI because you're obese, you have high BMI because you're muscled or you're genetically just have a better build, more muscle, more bone. So I think you should be able to attack that argument and, and be able to use your knowledge to get what you need and to be on an even playing field with other people who may have different genetic backgrounds. Thanks for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth.